All right, so today we're going to do the paper six, which is the alternative to the practical for coordinated sciences. Okay, this is for Cambridge uh, International Examination, CIE, and this is for the IGCSE. This is May, June 2018, and this is variant one, so the code is 0654 slash 61. I'm Alicia, and I'm going to be doing the biology and chemistry parts with you, and Mike is going to take over for the physics parts. All right. Let's begin. Let's get this party started. You know it. Question one. A student investigates an enzyme catalyzed reaction. A. Hydrogen peroxide is broken down by catalase, an enzyme found in living cells such as the cells of many types of bean. Oxygen gas is released during the reaction. So this is the procedure. The student places some bean puree into a measuring cylinder. He adds 10 centimeters cubed of hydrogen peroxide solution of concentration 1.5% to the measuring cylinder and then starts a stop clock. As oxygen gas is released, a foam is made in the mixture and the volume of the mixture in the measuring cil cylinder increases. He records the volume of the mixture in the measuring cylinder every 30 seconds for 5 minutes. His results are shown in table 1.1. Okay, and these are the results. All right, very good. One, on the grid provided, plot a graph of a volume of mixture, which is the vertical axis, against time. And you need to label the axes. All right. Okay, let's start by labeling the axes. Okay, so the, they said the x-axis is time. And that's time in seconds. And the volume is on the y-axis in centimeters cubed. All right. Okay, so if we look at this, on the y-axis, every small square is one centimeter cubed. And on the x-axis, every five small squares is 20 centimeters cubed. Okay, so these are the points. All right. Um, if you notice, I've used an x to show the points because that's a lot easier to see. Do not, in your exams, do a small dot like that. A large dot, and you can't tell exactly the point it is. So the, what the examiners like to see is either an X like that or a dot with a circle around it so you know exactly where the point is because once you draw a line through that point sometimes it can be very difficult to see. All right. Okay so two says to draw the best fit smooth curve on this graph and if you notice it says smooth curve. If it's a smooth curve that means don't use a ruler. It just means to draw it as best as you can, possibly can, uh, smoothly along it. And it doesn't have to hit all the points. That's okay. So when you're drawing these, when you're drawing your graphs, you should always do all graphs and all drawings in pencil because it's very easy to make a mistake. If you were to draw one of these X's in the wrong place and you were, were to, to try and scribble it out with because you did it in pen, and then draw it in the, in the right place, the examiner just gets grouchy and often will, will mark it wrong because you can still see where the point was. Draw it in pencil, draw it hard enough so that the examiner can see, but soft enough so that when you erase it, because you've made a mistake, because inevitably you will make a mistake somewhere, you don't see where the point was originally. Okay, so you want to make sure your, your graph is as neat as possible. Now that drawing the, the line of the smooth curve is one that's just really difficult to do nicely the first time. Okay, that's not too bad, but I'm going to correct it and make it a bit better. So you should always do your drawings in pencil. Okay, that's a bit better. So the key is draw your graphs and drawings in pencil. Okay, good. Sharp pencil, but make sure it's, it's in pencil. B1. Use your graph to predict the volume of the mixture at 200 seconds and show on your graph how you arrived at your answer. All right. Okay, so 200 seconds is right here. So what you want to do is use your ruler and draw a line up to 200 seconds to where it hits the line of best fit. Then once you've reached that point, you want to then move it over. Take that line and go over to where it hits the y-axis. 
Okay, and that shows how you got your point. And that looks extremely close to 45 centimeters cubed. Okay, and so we can make a point on there and we could say, we could label it um, volume at 200 seconds. You don't have to necessarily put that on because it says clearly what it shows what you're doing. However, the more information you put on, the more the examiner knows what you talk knows that you know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay, so the answer we read was 45 and the, the volume's already on there, centimeters cubed. Okay, good. So use your graph to state how the rate of reaction changed during the five minutes. So as you can see, for the first bit of the graph, the rate was pretty steady. Okay, the amount increased a very similar amount each for each reading. But for the second bit of the graph, at about 200 seconds, the amount of foam increased less, which means the rate of reaction decreased. Okay, let's just write that in. The rate of the reaction decreases during the five minutes. All right, good. C, state and explain a safety precaution the student should have taken when carrying out the procedure, assuming they did. They even put the and in bold letters, which means you must do both, even though it's only for one mark. Okay, so there's two things you could have used. You could have said that they should have used gloves because they were using enzymes, or the very standard one, they're using liquids, so you should always wear goggles to protect your eyes from splashes. That's the one I'll write down. Okay, so wear goggles to protect eyes from splashes. All right, let's move on. D, plan an experiment using the same method as an A to investigate the effect of changing the temperature of the hydrogen peroxide solution on the volume of the mixture. So you're changing the temperature and you're measuring the volume. They make it, they make it easier by saying you're using the same method, you just have to say it a few extra things. So in your answer, you should include the variables you need to keep constant, the suggestions for values of the variable you're going to change, and how you would present your results on a graph. Okay, there's lots of things you could put down. Let's say you should use the same volume of the peroxide solution. Okay, you should also use the same concentration of the peroxide solution. It would be kind of silly if they weren't. Okay, other things you could do, you could say the same volume of bean puree. Or the same batch of bean puree. Or an, another couple things you could do, you can choose. Either you measure the height the bubbles get in a fixed amount of time, so the same time, or you measure the, uh, fi the time it takes for the bubbles to get to a certain height. As long as you're keeping one of those constant, you're okay. But you can't put down both because one of them you're measuring, one of them you're recording. Okay? You say the same time. For bubbles to grow. Okay? Or the same height uh, in a specific amount of time. Okay? So those are some variables to keep constant. You probably don't need all four of those because it's only four marks. So you still need to put down two more things. So you probably only need about three. Two or three. But put down put down a few. Don't waste too much time on this though. What you want to change, so you want to change Obviously, um, you're changing the temperature. It says you're changing the temperature. Okay. But you need to say the values you'd change it to. Okay, so a common number of values you'd want to do is five temperatures. Okay, and we're just going to guess five reasonable temperatures. Well, bean puree they're using an enzyme and most enzymes have a, 
an optimum temperature around 37 degrees, which is our human body temperature, 37 degrees. So let's say nice easier temperatures to do, let's say 25 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius, and 45 degrees Celsius. Okay, it's not 37, but you should see a nice curve with that. Okay, good. And finally, uh, you need to show how you would present your results on a graph. Okay, so the graph, you would graph, as you've said, you're going to take the same time for bubbles to grow. You're going to take uh, the volume in a fixed amount of time against temperature. Okay, so the volume of bubbles in a fixed time against temperature. So what you do is you do it, you do, do a little graph that looks like this. You'd have temperature in degrees Celsius down here, and you would have volume centimeters cubed up the side. All right, good. That is the end of this question. Question two. A student is given three colorless solutions, H, J, and K. These three solutions are the halide solutions shown. One sodium bromide solution, one sodium chloride solution, and one is sodium iodide solution. The student does not know which solution is which. He carries out tests to identify the solutions. So part A. The steps involved in the, this test is he places about two centimeters cubed of solution H in a test tube. He adds a few drops of silver nitrate solution. He then adds ammonia solution until the test tube is nearly full. He stirs the mixture carefully. He records his observation in table 2.1, and then he repeats the above steps for solutions J and K. And what he's found is when he added the silver nitrate solution, solution H had a white precipitate, solution J had a cream colored precipitate, and solution K had a yellow, pale yellow precipitate. Okay, when he added the excess ammonia and stirred, then in solution H, the precipitate completely disappeared, it dissolved, and the solution was colorless. In J, the precipitate dissolved a little bit, and solution K, it, the precipitate didn't do anything, it remained exactly the same. One, use the observations in table 2.1 to identify which solution, H, J, or K, is sodium chloride solution. Explain how you reached your identification. Okay, so with this information, I can tell you that sodium chloride solution is solution H. And how do I know that? Well, because there was a white precipitate and that it dissolved in ammonia. Okay, so if it's a white precipitate, that's going to be the chloride ions. If it's a cream color precipitate, that's the bromide ions. And if it's a pale yellow precipitate, that's the iodide ions. Now, this sounds like a nice easy test. It's nice and easy to describe and use those words. But when you're actually doing it in person, it's very difficult to tell the difference between cream colored and pale yellow. And even white is still, sometimes you, you get a bit confused. But if they're just writing it on the piece of paper, it's nice and easy and clear. All right. So part two, state and explain whether the addition of silver nitrate solution followed by excess ammonia solution can be used to distinguish between the three halide solutions, H, J, and K. And yes, it can. The precipitates are all different colors. So yes, it can, as the precipitates are different colors. So that's stating yes or no, and explaining because the precipitates are different colors. Okay, so let's move on. Three, the nitric acid is usually added to the unknown solution before adding silver nitrate solution. Explain why adding nitric acid first is not necessary in this test for this investigation. Okay, so what hap the reason why you add nitric acid in the first place is because if there's any carbonate in the solution and then you add the silver nitrate, the carbonate will react with the silver nitrate and form this precipitate and that will confuse the issue. Okay, in this instance, you're told that it is just the halide ions. You're told exactly what's in the solution other than which solution is which. 
Okay, we already know the solutions are halides not, and not carbonates. B. The student then adds chlorine water to separate samples of the three solutions H, J, and K. He records his observation in Table 2.2. Okay, so when he add, added chlorine water to solution H, no visible change ha ha occurred. To solution J, it becomes pale yellow, or in solution K, the solution became a very dark orange. All right, so use the observations in Table 2.2 to suggest which two solutions, H, J, and K, could be, so could be sodium bromide solution. Explain your answer in terms of the reactions which take place. Okay, so either J or K could be the bromide solution because the difference between a yellow and an orange can sometimes be a bit hard to see depending on the light and, and the concentration of the, the, of the ions. Okay, so they, either of them could have the bromine color. The no visible change, no, that's not, that's not solution H. So either could have the bromine color. So what they would do normally in a, in a lab because it's sometimes really hard to tell if it's a yellow or an orange or, or what which color is which, they would have a known reference solution. So they would have a solution they would already know of sodium bromide that when it reacts with chlorine water to compare it to. So which one is closest to that? That's a reference solution, but you don't have to answer that in this question. Two, suge suggest one precaution that the student could take when using chlorine water. Okay, it says one, which means don't put down two. If you get the second one wrong, they'll mark the first one wrong. If they cancel each other out. Okay, so one precaution that you should definitely use is use a fume cupboard or a well-ventilated lab. Okay, because the chlorine gas that can be produced is very, very harmful. Okay. Okay, so use a fume cupboard so you don't breathe in the horrible, toxic chlorine fumes. Three, describe another test that could be carried out on the two solutions you identified B1 and B1 to show which solution is sodium bromide and which solution is sodium iodide. State the expected observations for sodium bromide solution and sodium iodide solution. Okay, and there's two possible things you could put down. Okay, um, the one that I would put down is I would add starch. And just like in biology, adding starch or adding iodine to starch turns it blue-black, if you add starch to iodine, it also turns it blue-black. So if you add starch, the iodide solution turns blue-black. The other one you could put down is if you add bromine water, the iodide solution will go a darker orange. Okay? But blue-black, it goes from a, a pale color to a dark blue-black. It's very easy to tell. C. A sample of sodium chloride solution can be made by reacting hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide solution. Sodium hydroxide solution is added slowly to 25 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid in the presence of an indicator. When the indicator changes color, the volume of sodium hydroxide solution, has, which has been added, is recorded. The reaction is then repeated using 25 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid and the recorded volume of sodium hydroxide solution, but without the indicator. Okay, that to me sounds like a titration. Okay, so name a suitable piece of apparatus for measuring the volume of the sodium hydroxide solution. So the thing you normally use for a titration is a burette. You could also say you use a graduated pipette. And the reason why it's a graduated pipette, you don't use a dropping pi pipette. Dropping pipettes are not very accurate, but a graduated pipette has the little marks, the graduations, to show the more precise measurements. But a burette is more commonly used for titration. Okay, so explain why the reaction is repeated without the indicator. And the reason why is because the indicator is an impurity and you're trying to test it, be very, very accurate. And three, suggest a change to the experiment which would enable the volume of sodium hydroxide solution added to be determined more, to, to be determined more accurately. 
Okay, so to be more accurate, you have to repeat it. So you repeat the experiment again with an indicator and take the average volume. So you generally want to repeat twice. Okay, so repeat the experiment with the indicator and take the average. Okay, so I said you need to, you generally want to repeat an experiment twice. That means do it once and then do two repeats, so that ends up being three in total. Well, they already did it once with the indicator, once without the indicator, and they're going to do it again with the indicator, so that's three times. Okay, more times is better, but at least three times is the minimum. Question three. A student investigates how the length L of a spring varies when different loads, large L, are added onto it. A. She sets up a spring and a clamp as shown in figure 3.1. Measure and record the length L0 of the unstretched spring to the nearest millimetre. Alright, so what you're going to need to do here is pull out your ruler and physically measure it on the paper. Now, a word of warning, when I measured this, I got 26 millimetres. If I write that down, the answer will be wrong. Why is it wrong? I absolutely measured it right. Well, it's wrong because it's printed out in the wrong size paper. Myself, I've printed this out in letter size, so the measurement is different to what they expect. If you print it out in A4, it might still be different. What they expect is it to be printed by the examining board on the paper that they're actually using for their exams. If you measure it there, then you'll get the actual number. The number that they're looking for here is 28 millimetres. There we are. So it's possible you might be working through this, uh, maybe you've printed one off yourself, maybe your teacher's given you one that's been printed out, and you measure it and the number you get is not 28 millimetres. That's okay. Don't worry about that. But the number in the back here that they're expecting is 28 millimetres. Just understand, be happy with the idea that when you get to the exam, the measurement that you take will be the measurement that will get the marks. Obviously, as long as you take the measurement right. Two, state one precaution that the student takes to avoid parallax error, the line of sight error. Right. When uh, measuring the length of the spring. Well, key point, view at 90 degrees. or perpendicular. Exactly the same thing to the scale. There we are. Other things you could do, of course, you could use a fiduciary marker as well. That would work very well too. B. She hangs a load, the large L, of one newton on the spring and measures to the nearest millimetre the new length little l of the spring using a metre rule. Part of the rule shown in figure 3.2, use the rules provided, 3.2, to measure the new length of the spring. Okay, so what they want you to do here is use the diagram to come up with the actual measurement. So what you'll be doing is looking across here as best you can to get the right values. And this is a situation, another one, where it might be quite useful to be using a ruler to do this. All right, so from this, I'm going to say that this measurement here is 69.8. This one down here, 65.9, which means the difference here between these two, which is the length of the spring. And as always with these questions, write down your working out. Length of the spring, 69.8 minus 65.9, and that gives me 3.9 centimetres. There we go. Record this length in table 3.1. So 3.9 centimetres, 39 millimetres. Okay. So there we go. On the grid provided, plot a graph of the masses being used, or the weight being used, L against the little L, which is the length of the spring. Start both axes from the origin. Ah, key point here. So they're telling us they want the graph to start from zero, zero. Which means, if we can do a better scale, yeah, if we can say, hey, you know what, a jump in the axis would be even better, it gives a much, much better graph, don't do it. They don't want you to do it. They want you to start from zero, zero. Do what they want. It's very important. Okay, especially when they've clearly stated it. Now, 
we have to put five up to five newtons on the y-axis so one newton two newtons three newtons four newtons and five newtons will be right up the top there coming along the bottom here we have we have to go all the way up to 82 Ooh, so 20 millimeters 40 60 80 100 the axes are already labeled so we're doing well now we can mark in the details from the graph okay so one newton should have a length of 39 millimeters just there two newtons should have a length of 50 millimeters dead center there three newtons a length of 60 oh dear me that's silly isn't it there we are three newtons a length of 60 never be afraid to correct your work as you go through it and realize you've made a mistake you will make mistakes that's okay don't panic relax just go through it and change it it's no problem at all four newtons 73 so four newtons at 70 there 73 there we go and finally five newtons 82 so five newtons i should be up at 82 there we go all right let's see what we do now draw best fit straight line and then use the graph to determine the length l naught of the unstretched spring so we want to know the length when there's no weight on it okay first of all let's draw that line there we go now we've got the best line fit there and this point where the graph reaches the x-axis is the length of the spring without any weight on it. The length of the unstretched spring. It says to state clearly where it comes from, so there we show on your graph how you arrived at this value. And that number there is about 29. Let's put that in our answer. 29 millimeters. Compare your answer A1 with your answer in C3. So that's the one that we measured in the original picture, the very first picture. And it's asking, are they the same? And yeah, they're pretty similar. One's 29 millimeters, one's 28 millimeters. So within the limits of experimental accuracy, they're the same. So within the limits of experimental accuracy, they agree. E. The gradient of your line measures the force constant of a spring. This is a measure of the elastic stiffness of the spring. The greater the force constant, the harder it is to stretch the spring. On your graph, draw a line to show how this, the length of the spring with a greater force constant changes as loads are added to it. Greater force constant, what it's saying is it's more difficult to stretch. It takes a lot more force to stretch it. So that means for the same amount of force, you're going to see a smaller stretch. Let's look at how that's going to work. Now, the same amount of force, I'm going to get a small stretch. What does that mean? That means it's not going to stretch as much. It'll be a steeper line. And we want to label that line M. There we go. Question four. A student is studying cells. Figure 4.1 shows a photograph of some animal duodenum cells. One of these cells is labeled cell A. Okay, right here. All right. A1. In the box below, make a, an enlarged and detailed pencil drawing of cell A. Okay, now what you have to remember when you're doing drawings in biology is that you are not an artist. All right. It says draw it in pencil. Quite often they don't tell you to draw it in pencil, but you do have to use a pencil. And the reason why is because if you make a mistake, you need to be able to er erase it. Okay. They generally want a soft pencil, but a sharp pencil, so an HB pencil. Same as with graphs. Okay, so when you're doing your drawings, you need to draw nice, smooth, s solid lines. Okay, that is a circle. This is not a circle. This is not a circle. You will lose marks for drawing circles like that. That's not how they close. Okay, another thing you can't do is something called feathering. 
this is feathering. Okay, you're feathering, you're finding the approximate outline of a something, whatever you're drawing. Okay, that's not what you're, you're not allowed to do that. You will lose marks. Okay, don't shade. I can't shade using this, this apparatus on the, on the computer. But if you shade something in, you will lose marks. Do not make it, do not make it prettier is the way to do it. Just do a generally, just do the outline, the simple outline of whatever it is you're doing. And you have to always make sure that you're drawing approximately the same shape. Okay, the other, another thing you have to do when you're drawing in with biology is you have to make sure you draw it to the, to the same proportions. Okay, so with this diagram, you'll notice it has a line that goes up and down. You, you don't just say, ah, it's squiggly. So it's kind of like that. Okay, that's not the sort of squiggle it is. It's a squiggle that goes down, up, and then down. Okay, it has to be the same shape. Another thing you have to do is make sure you use up as much space as you can without going out of the box. Don't ever draw over top of the, the writing. All right, good. And the other thing it says, yes, it wants a detailed diagram, but these little tiny marks in here, there's little tiny, lots of little things in here, and little tiny bits in here. You don't need to draw that sort of detail, okay? What you are drawing, what you are drawing is the outline. So basically you're drawing the outline, not on here, obviously. I'm just doing this roughly. You're doing the outline here. You can probably tell that there's another layer here. And you can see that there is the nucleus that's approximately this shape at about this position in the cell. And that's really all you're drawing. Okay. And now you just have to do that onto the other, uh, into, into the big box. Okay. So I'll just draw in that cell into the box. Okay, so this is my drawing of the cell. As you can tell, uh, being a not very artistic person, the drawing part of this, of these biology parts of the exam is always the part I dread most. But even if you are as bad a drawer as I am, you can still get full marks by drawing what you see. Now, this is not perfect. I know the, wor the more I try and correct it, the worse it gets. It's, it's the way it works. So that's why you have to draw in pencil and draw lightly so you can erase it. Okay, but draw the outline, draw the main details, and they don't really want to see more than that. Okay, at this level, they are giving a mark for making sure you have a clear outline of the cell and that is, there's no feathering. I don't think I would lose a mark for the feathering that it's slightly thicker around here, maybe slightly thicker there, maybe slightly thicker there, but I don't think that's enough to, to lose a mark. Okay, you have to be very, very careful about those little connections. Okay, you want to make sure it's approximately the correct shape and that there's a nucleus. Okay, so that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for exactly the right shape. Uh, because you don't have to, this is a biology class, it isn't an art class. And you need to make sure it's larger than the original drawing, and because it needs to take up most of the space in the box, and it needs to only be one cell, because they only told you to draw one cell. They told you to draw cell A, not all the cells in the diagram. Okay, oh, that's what you'll get the mark for on, on the diagram in this case. Okay, two, draw a label line to label the nucleus of the cell in your drawing. All right, we can do that. So the nucleus is right here. And if you notice, this line should be drawn with a ruler and it is a straight line. It's just, there's no arrowhead at the end. A label line does not involve an arrowhead at the end. And now you have to label it, nucleus. B1, measure in millimeters to the nearest millimeter the length of cell A between points X and Y in figure 4.1. Okay. Okay, so what you need to do is put your ruler between X and Y and just measure this line here. Okay, that's what you do. Now, when I measured this, I got a measurement of 47 
millimeters. But that's not the answer in the back, back of the test. It is 51 millimeters is what, she, what you should be getting. But I do know how to use my ruler. The reason why I got a different measurement is because I printed this out on different paper to a different scale slightly, just very slightly, to what the examiners use. I'm going to use the actual number that it should be just because it makes things easier. Okay. So I'm going to put down 51 millimeters. It doesn't really matter. I could put down the 47. This is just my practice exam. Sometimes it makes a difference. Sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it probably doesn't. But I like to use the one that they suggest in the back. As long as I know I know how to use a ruler. Okay, so draw the line x to y on your di on your drawing in the same place as x, y are shown, x and y are shown on figure 4.1. Measure this line in millimeters to the nearest millimeter. Okay, so the x and y, we have x up here, we have y down here, and we just need to draw a nice line between them. Okay, so we just draw our line between x and y with a ruler, the way you the way you'd expect to. Okay, always use a ruler. Now, it's good practice to put the beginning and end of the line with a with another line perpendicular. It makes it easier to see. Sometimes it's hard to see where the end of it is. Okay, when I measure this line on my piece of paper, I got 96 millimeters, so I'll use that number. Okay, so we have 96 millimeters. Okay, three. Use your two measurements to calculate the magnification of your drawing and show you're working in the space below. Okay, so magnification. Equals your drawing size. Over the actual size. Okay, so that equals 96 millimeters over top of 51 millimeters. And the units cancel out. So the answer here equals 1.89 and you don't say 1.89 magnification you say 2 times magnified and C describe how you could test cells in a liquid sample for the presence of fat okay so this is called the ethanol emulsion test so it says to use the reagents used and the method okay so the reagents we use we add alcohol to the sample okay and then we pour that sample of the alcohol in the sample into pure water and that's all we do for the test now the observation if it's positive as you will see a white emulsion And five, a student prepares a pure sample of blue copper sulfate crystals using copper carbonate powder and dilute sulfuric acid. Okay, this is the equation they use. Copper carbonate plus sulfuric acid produces copper sulfate plus carbon dioxide plus water. He plans his experiment in a series of steps labeled A to F. But the teacher says that all of the steps are correct, but they're in the wrong order. A, using the letters, place the steps into the correct order. Step, steps one and six have been completed for you. How helpful. All right, so let's look at this. So you start off measuring out 25 centimeters cubed of sulfuric acid into a beaker, okay? And you end off drying the crystals in filter paper. Okay, what do you do next? All right. So after you've measured out 25 centimeters cubed of acid into, a, acid into a beaker, you add the copper carbonate to the acid, a little bit at a time until you don't, until nothing else reacts. So this is step two. Okay, once you have as much copper carbonate in the acid as you can, then you have to filter out the mixture. So that is step three. So remove the excess stuff that didn't react. Okay, then, well, one's leave the basin to cool, one's heat it up. You probably want to heat it up before you let it cool. So that would be step four, and then leaving it to cool would be step five. All right, now let's write that in. 
Okay, so we have step two is A, step three is D, step four is B, step five is E, and then step six is being done for you. All right, good. So just how the student would know when no more carp copper carbonate reacted. Well, there's two ways you can do. First of all, you keep mixing, you keep stirring, and when it doesn't dissolve, when you can see green powder or green solids still in the, in the liquid, even after you mix it, then you know it's not reacting anymore. It's, it's, not, it's not dissolving, okay? Or it's a reaction that creates carbon dioxide and water. So the carbon dioxide are bubbles. So if you don't see any more bubbles, then you know it's not reacting anymore. So either of those would work. Okay, so I wrote down no more bubbles. All right. C, draw, draw a diagram of step D and label the apparatus and the substances. Now drawings in chemistry, don't, they're not quite as picky as they are about, about being uh, very careful as they are in biology, but you still have to be as neat as, as you can. So step D was filter the mixture. So we draw basically the, the filtering setup. Okay. So we have here, this is our filter funnel. And we have our filter paper. All right. Inside our filter paper, we have our copper carbonate. residue. So that's the stuff, that's a solid left behind. Okay. And this here is our flask. That's our receiving vessel. And finally, we have our copper sulfate filtrate. All right, so we have we have the filtrate, the residue, we have our funnel with the filter paper and the flask, and that's all that it needs. Okay, good. D1, explain why the copper carbonate needs to be added until no more reacts. Okay, the reason for that is you need to make sure all of the acid has reacted so that the crystals are pure. Okay, to make sure all of the acid has reacted so crystals are pure. And two, explain why only half of the water is evaporated in step B, step B. And that's because if you leave some water there, then you will get very large crystals. It, the size of the crystals depends upon how quickly the crystals form. So, so to get large crystals, you will still get copper sulfate crystals if you eva evaporate almost all of the liquid, they'll just be really tiny. Okay, they're just prettier and easier to work with if they're big. E, the student takes a few crystals of copper sulfate and dissolves them into water in a test tube. He adds a few drops of ammonia solution and stirs. He continues adding the ammonia a few drops at a time until the ammonia is in excess. Describe what the student observes in the test tube. Okay, so first, first of all is the solution will be a deep blue. Okay. Okay, the other thing he'll see is he'll see a pale blue precipitate. Okay, so you'll see a deep blue solution and a pale blue precipitate. All right, and that's the end of the biology and the chemistry sections. On to physics to finish off this paper. Question number six. A student investigates the energy efficiency of a model railway. He sets up an oval track of circumference 10 meters and places a train consisting of a locomotive and three carriages onto it as shown in figure 6.1. The DC power supply is connected to the train track. The electricity goes from the power supply to the train and is then used in turn to power the motor in the train. Part A. Complete the circuit diagram shown in figure 6.2 using appropriate circuit symbols, which include an ammeter to measure the current supply to the train and a voltmeter to measure the potential difference of the power supply. All right.
So the fault meter is measuring the potential difference of the power supply, so we'll put it across the power supply. There we go. And again, making sure that all the wires are touching. There we go. And we're going to want an ammeter to measure the entire current being supplied. Oops, there we go. The entire current being supplied to the train. There we are. So we put it, of course, in series with the circuit. There we are. Excellent. Gives us a voltmeter across the power supply and an ammeter measuring the current in the circuit. B. The student switches on the power supply and waits until the train is running at a steady speed. He measures the current I in the circuit, the potential difference V across the power supply, and the time T it takes for the train to travel once around the track. 1. Figure 6.3 shows the readings on the ammeter, the voltmeter and the timer. Read and record these values in the spaces below to two significant figures. OK, so we have to read and record these values. First one here, that looks to me to be about 0 0.12 amps. This one over here, ah, that's, two, that's 3 here, so that's about 2.8 amps. And the last one, 11.82 seconds. So let's record those. 0 0.12 amps. Units are already there. 2.8 volts. And finally, 11.82 seconds. Two, calculate the electrical energy supplied to the train to complete one circuit of the track using the equation shown. The electrical energy supply equals current times voltage times time. Right, well there we go, we've got the numbers we need to use, we've got the equation. So let's calculate it out. Current times voltage times time, that's not 0.12 amps, multiplied by 2.8 volts. Make sure that these decimal points are nice and visible, there we go. Multiplied by 11.82 seconds. And that gives us a value of 3.97 or so. There we go. And that is in watts. Now, there we go. We get two significant figures for most of that. Not 0 0.12 amps, 2.8 volts. So we're really only going to want two significant figures in the answer. So 4.0 joules. Part 3. The mass M of the train is 1.6 kilograms. Calculate the kinetic energy of the train using the equation shown. Kinetic energy is 50 times M, which is the mass, divided by T squared. Alright, let's put that in. That's going to give us 50 times 1.6 kilograms. Make sure that decimal point's visible. There we go. Divided by 11.82. That's seconds squared. So it gives us a value of 0 0.57. And that is joules. And that's the two significant figures there, because of course we get two significant figures here and two significant figures there. So final answer is not 0.57 joules. And the units are already in. 4. Calculate the efficiency of the train using the equation shown. Hmm. Well, we've calculated the Electrical energy supplied, we've just calculated the kinetic energy, we're just putting it straight into that equation there. So let's just put that num those numbers in. It's not 0.57 joules, again make sure those decimal points are nice and visible, divided by 4.0 joules, multiplied by 100, and that will give us a value of 14%. And again, we've given the efficiency there to two significant figures because that's the numbers in the calculation. Right. Part C. Explain why the energy transfer is not 100% efficient. Well, you're always going to get a lot of energy lost due to heat. And, of course, because you've got an electric circuit, it's going to be lost in resistance. And it gets lost as heat. There we go. And D. Describe how the experiment could be modified to obtain a more accurate value for the time it takes the train to travel around the, ta the track. Well, they're just looking for the time it takes for the train to go around the track, similar to a pendulum. Do it more times, an average. There we go. Excellent. Good job. If you enjoyed that and you found that useful, please feel free to like and subscribe. 
And of course, if you've got any papers that you'd like us to run through, then uh, just leave a comment in the section below. Have a great day.